There you go. So welcome everybody. Hi, my name is Kari Kwas. I am with Snohomish Conservation District. Tonight I am joined by Sierra Rosero, who also is with the Conservation District. And we are uh, going to present on creating habitat for wildlife. Um, this is in partnership with the city of Everett. We're very excited that they sponsored this series. And we'll talk a little bit more about them and us here uh, as we get going. So I wanted to just introduce myself. My name is Kari. I do live in Everett, so this is why I always like this series. I'm a little biased, I'll admit it. Uh, but I'm the Community Engagement Project Manager for the district. And we recently did a uh, drawing birds class for youth. And so we included our favorite bird. So I put mine as the black cap chickadee, dee, dee, right? You know the sound. Um, and then also, my goodness, if you live anywhere in Everett or just around this region right now, the cherry blossoms are gorgeous. And so this one is just down the street from me. So I took advantage of that the other day. But feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about events at the district or different ways we engage with our community. So today for asking questions, um, please use the Q&A and then I will pass those off to Sarah. She is good with me asking them as they come up. So if you're just like, I really need to know, whatever, um, please uh, just type it into the Q&A and I will ask those. As you know, we're recording this class. So if you have questions later, you can um, go back and watch it again or you know, share with friends. It'll be on the website and I'll share it out via email too. So again, City of Everett, <clears throat> pardon me, sponsors these classes and we want only rain down the drain. So if you did not know, most of the drains, the storm drains, when you see them at the street and the curbs, all that goes right out to the water. If you've gone um, down to the waterfront, you can actually see it hit a part in the Port of Everett. There's a outflow there, you know, the, the Grand Avenue Park Bridge, that's all related to stormwater. So what we do at our house really matters in terms of the cleanliness of that water going out to the sea. And we all know we like to eat things out of the sea, you know, oysters or fish or whatever. So we wanna make sure that that is okay, but also all of the um, wildlife and everything that live in the water too. So 75% of pollutants entering Puget Sound comes from stormwater runoff. So that's a huge number. So everything that we do on land matters. So that's why they sponsor these series and they have a bunch of drainage basins, 22 of them. Um, and so make sure that your daily choices are in alignment with taking care of the sound. Some other upcoming events. And so we partner with the city during the spring and the fall on these education events. Next Thursday, April 7th, six o'clock, we're gonna be doing a family gardening class. So perhaps if you saw got heard about this through the insert at the libraries, both branches in Everett, you can pick up a family gardening kit and Michaela will be walking through those at that session next week and talk about how kids can be involved in the garden, which is an awesome place and thing for them to do to help out and kind of create the landscape around them. So we hope to see you next week. Also, there is a self-guided rain garden class um, tour that I'll send you out a map if you register for that. We've been doing this probably about three years now. It's kind of a nice thing to do on a sunny day. If you like to go on a rainy day, that's great too, because then you can see how a rain garden functions um, in the rain, that there might be some ponding, but it will you know, filter through and clean it and go down. So check that out. And then um, the rain garden program with the city of Everett is still in effect. And so that's a rebate program. It's up to $2,500. And so if you wanted to put in a rain garden at your house, you uh, go to everettwan.gov slash rain gardens. You'll see the different requirements for that program. And then you can sign up for a site assessment and they will come out to your property take a look and make sure that you're in a good spot for a rain garden. Um, it really needs to flow. If you have like wet areas that are always wet, probably not a good spot. But if it filters down, you kind of see it disappear after the rains go away, it's probably a good spot. So check that program out too. Quickly, also what a conservation district is, we're different than the city um, in that we're non-regulatory and we represent Camano uh, Island and Snohomish County. We are mandated to protect natural resources. Isn't that a great thing? So we help with education. We come out and do site visits. So you can, you're welcome to call us um, to come and take a look at your um, property and what you're working on, um, be it tied to habitat like Sarah's gonna talk about, 
or water on your property that you may or may not want, <laughs> ways to store it, rain gardens, rain barrels, all kinds of different things. We also work with farmers because our work came out of the Dust Bowl. So a lot of us were started early in the 40s. We started in Snohomish County in 1941. Um, so the land doesn't blow away. So we're gonna keep that soil healthy, the air healthy and water healthy, that's our job. And I just wanted to quickly say, if you haven't seen the art from our art contest this year, there were several entries from Everett, so great job. This one came from uh, Mary's Place, which is over by uh, Trinity Episcopal Church. They submitted a whole bunch of art and it was birds. Birds was the theme. <laughs> and if you can, uh, well, not believe it, but it, not surprisingly, Sarah was one of our judges for that contest because she loves birds so much. And we have a lot of people that love providing habitat for the um, wildlife around us. So check out the art contest. The link is there. I will put that in the chat. We also have habitat tips on our website and lots more events to come. So by all means, check that out. And then without further ado, I'll introduce Sarah Rosero. She's a bird lover, no surprise. Um, she's our outreach and habitat specialist at the district. And you can see her in her waders. They were out in Darrington a couple weeks ago doing some site visits and getting in the water. Um, her picture's actually of a black capped chickadee nest, which I love. Um, she can talk more about that, but we all have our favorites and we all have the things we wanna protect. So today she's gonna talk about how you can create habitat at your house uh, for the wildlife around us. So Sarah, I'll stop sharing and then you can share. So thanks. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. Thank you, Kari. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and get going here. And yeah, just for reference for that photo, um, my backyard backs up to an NGPA, a native growth protection area. And unfortunately, these chickadees nested in a snag, which they're cavity nesters, so that's not too alarming. But that weak point where that cavity was in the snag, it snapped. And so kind of just went over there to check it out and was able to like climb up part of the tree and take a picture of the nest and it was exposed and vulnerable. So my partner and I took some pieces of wood and like screwed it back in and like made sure the chickadees could get back in. And we checked a couple weeks later, the eggs had successfully hatched and hopefully they fledged. Um, but just a very small part in trying to do the right thing, intervening, which always sometimes isn't great, but I, my heart couldn't take it. Uh, so welcome and really excited to be here with you all. So kind of some of the things that we'll be covering today is why should we create habitat? Uh, what are the importance of native plants and how are some ways that we can provide great sustainable habitat for wildlife? So I really wanted to get into a, a very local example about habitat fragmentation. Um, using Everett as an example, since that's where we are all uh, joining from, hopefully, or you know what this program is about. And this is a large scale problem, not just in Everett, but in every major city, every urban area, you know, across the globe, or United States. Um, but what the issue is, is that there are habitats that are fragmented. So there is some habitat here, um, but there's no connection. There's no connectivity from one wooded area, one habitat to another. And so being able to provide habitat on your yard, on your property, on your balcony, if you live um, in an apartment or someplace without a yard, you can also do your part of creating these little corridors, creating these little pieces of habitat where animals can go along the way, be safe, um, and go about their business of reproducing and raising their young, which is like the goal of their entire life is just to reproduce. Um, and so we have kind of a comparison here, blocked out uh, some of the addresses just to keep it, you know, anonymous. Um, but it's a good example of, you know, a monoculture with having a lawn and then being able to offer a wide variety of plants. So the goal is on the right and you know standard is kind of what's on the left here where it's you know maybe a few sparse planting some lawn um, and you know 
this is how homes start, you know, not a lot of places when homes are developed have a lot of landscaping. And if the landscaping is there, it's typically not native plants. So being able to increase that diversity with native plants, um, some non-native and really be able to have that connectivity for different habitats and offering a diversity of plants on your own property. So why go native? Why should we plant native plants? Well, not only can they be incredibly beautiful, but they're incredibly adapted to our local wildlife. Um, they've evolved over a long period of time. And some of the other benefits is that they're really adapted to our climate. So that means less watering. You know, you don't have to fertilize or keep watering your specific plant who's maybe not from this area and you know needs either more water during the summer and or you know it has struggling with too much water when you know we can get very wet here in the pacific northwest and they're really able to resist some native pests and diseases so we see these a lot with ornamentals you know they bring in um and have some exotic diseases. And so you're trying to troubleshoot what's going on here. Um, but the great thing is that after a year or two of planting a native plant, depending on the location of where you put it in your yard, you really don't have to water it after that. Like once it's established, it's kind of just free to go and gonna do its own thing. Um, but the really important thing here is being able to provide that habitat and those resources for our local wildlife. Um, and not only do plants provide resources, but they also help filter that water. So what Kari spoke about earlier with stormwater being the, you know, almost number one source of pollution for the Puget Sound, what was it, 75%, you know, that needs to be filtered better. And plants do an incredible job of filtering water, making it cleaner before it goes into the waterways. And that benefits all of us, right? It benefits our health, it benefits the health of other species, um, especially when we talk about salmon. Salmon really need that clean water in all of our um, aquatic species as well. So what does the research say? What, what is the deal with native plants? Well, in terms of bird populations, they found that having at least 70% of native plants on your property or in one given habitat, it really increases the likelihood that that bird population is gonna be steady and it's going to keep increasing and they'll have, uh, they'll be successful in raising their young, right? So that whole purpose of like, all they wanna do is reproduce, and pass on their genes. And so being able to give them native plants where they can forage, glean all year round is really the best way to do that. Uh, and we can talk about native plants as well. And I'm really happy to give anyone um, plant suggestions along the way. And we'll also talk about some specific native plants as well. Um, in terms of like, are there certain native plants better for wildlife than other? I'm like, yes and no. I think it really depends on what you want to focus on. Like if you want to focus on birds, sure, there will be a few better native plants that are better for birds than others. Uh, but we can get in that too if you all have questions. So migrating wildlife, man, we are on this Pacific flyaway. And if anyone is interested in shorebirds or waterfowl, going to Gray's Harbor during the migration season is fantastic because there are species coming from all over the place, right? From down south, going up north. Um, and so some of these species are even here in Washington, but it's a great stopping ground before they go into the next location. And that's also the importance of having uh, resources and, you know, plants and everything else on your property is that you're able to make sure that those birds get to their destination by being able to forage, um, take some cover and rest before they get going on their journey and being able to, to sustain them through their journey because boy, it is an arduous journey. And I do not envy these little small Rufus hummingbirds who have to go all the way from Mexico and come back up to you know, Washington. I think I've seen the first Rufus hummingbird of the year and it was probably a couple of weeks ago. And it's just so impressive how much um, they travel for such tiny little birds too. 
So we're gonna go into the four elements of what wildlife really need. Like what is the dirt and bones? What's the nitty gritty? What does it come down to? So what it comes down to is food, water, cover, and places to raise young, right? The end goal is to reproduce, pass those genes on, and then they feel like they've accomplished their goal and they do that throughout their lifetime. And so we will dive deeper into those four different elements. Um, before we do that though, it's great to do like a little site assessment. So on your property, in your front yard, backyard, side yard, wherever you wanna put native plants, some of the factors you need to think about is soil. So what is your soil moisture like? Is your soil really dry? Um, does it drain really well? Is it, is it full of clay so it holds water really well? What's your sunlight? Do you have part shade? Is it full sun, just completely exposed? Or do you have a little shady area? And that will almost dictate what kind of plants that will work on your property um, and being able to you know, have those resources for wildlife. So the habitat elements again, food, uh, not always in the form of berries. And then we have some water and we have cover. So brush piles, things like that. And then places to raise young. So those can be supplemental boxes, some nesting boxes, or it can also be vegetation. So native plants as food. A lot of this, uh, birds like to glean. So sometimes, you know, Kari may see a chickadee hanging upside down, you know, getting an insect or a seed, um, but it's really about that. Uh, insects that are on the ground and on plants and then berries, seeds, you know, nectar, sap, all the above, right? And so those invertebrates, you know, you'll see what is it? Early bird gets the worm. So all the robins like in the morning, just running across the ground, stop, do a little tapping, try to get that worm. There are a lot of different elements, right? So we're able to have healthy ecosystems and healthy habitats. These birds have more success in finding those resources. And what studies show is that when birds are able to have um, access to more resources, then they, they can successfully fledge more young. So they're able to feed more young and they're successful in their fledging and becoming juveniles and then adults. So some great native plants for food. So we have Western Columbine, which has this beautiful flower. It's a deciduous plant, so kind of dies back uh, in the fall and winter. Uh, it's great for shaded areas, but it can tolerate some sun. And then what folks don't really think about as um, a great plant for food is Oregon stone crops, so all these sedums. They're great for dry areas, even rock gardens, but they still provide um, little hiding places for insects. I'll see birds and or northern flickers uh, kind of like putting their bills in there and trying to get some insects and, you know, having flowers that attract butterflies and bees like that. So insects and invertebrates are really important, especially during the breeding season, not only for birds, but also for amphibians and other types of wildlife, because it really starts at that lowest level of the food chain or the food web, right? Insects are like the basis of what everything needs until it goes up the food chain and moves up that ladder. And, you know, you're gonna go from a worm to, you know, let's say like a bald eagle. And what that process shows is that, you know, the salamander eats the worm and then the snake eats the salamander and then the red-tailed hawk eats the snake. It's always, it's complex, but it's also very interesting. And being able to kind of key into some of those small details of what's eating what, you know, if I still want to attract birds, are insects really important to me? And the answer is yes. Uh, so, Birds, terrestrial birds specifically, really rely on feeding insects to their young, right? Because they're abundant um, and it's really good protein for those little tiny furless, featherless babies to get really big and strong before they're able to fledge and fly on their own. Um, so we're just a couple of examples here of some of these birds. We've got a wren and then a dark-eyed junco. And then of course, this long-toed salamander eating a a uh, little worm that came up on my driveway at night and I was taking out the trash and just happened to see it, which is 
exciting because sometimes you don't always see those little amphibians, right? Like birds are easy to see because they're everywhere, um, but sometimes you may not be seeing some of the things that are on your property. So other native plants on food. Man, red flowering currant is one of, in my opinion, the most beautiful shrubs. So they have these beautiful pink flowers. I always like to have a red flowering currant on my property because I have just loved hummingbirds for as long as I know. And they're great attractants for hummingbirds. Um, and they do produce small little berries. Um, and it's really great for other pollinators, you know, solitary bees, anything else. It's a versatile plant, so it can tolerate some shade and it can also tolerate full sun. And it goes from soil moisture to like moist to dry. So it's pretty versatile. And, you know, with some pruning here and there, it's not getting gigantic, but, you know, depending on what you're going for, you want to maybe not prune it or prune it a little bit more than usual, depending on the kind of space you're working for and everything else. Um, another low grower is Salau. So Salau has edible berries that I enjoy eating. They're a little dry, so I like to dehydrate my Salau berries and they kind of just use them for like fun backpacking food. Um, great for bees, really great for other pollinators and birds love Salau berries. They're delicious, especially cedar wax wings. They'll just gobble up like five berries at a time. It's always fun to see. And then dull ogre and grape. Ogre grape are also edible berries and it's another great one for other wildlife. Um, it's an evergreen, so it does provide that great aesthetic look during the winter time where everything else has lost leaves. And it's really one of those ones that sometimes folks uh, mix up with English holly with those kind of spiky, pokey leaves. Um, it can make a great barrier if that's also something you're going for to like deter folks from entering this area plant some organ grape and I assure you they will not like how it feels if they're trying to get into that space. Uh, another one is vine maple. Uh, it is a really beautiful plant. It's a, you know, it, it's a sprawly tree. I wouldn't say it's like a very upright tree, um, but all the seeds and everything that it does is so beneficial to many wildlife. And I think there's a lot of different bird species that it supports as well as other pollinators, um, but vine maple does like more shade. Um, some have been successful growing in full sun. It's just, it's gonna be stressed. So, right, it's not gonna get like entirely big. So have to kind of like coax it along the way, or it's a great addition if you have like a taller tree to put under it. Lupin, if you like to, <laughs> If you like to do yard work, lupin's a great one because it spreads everywhere. And if you're only wanting it in one area, you're gonna have a lot of fun pulling some lupin out. But don't let that discourage you because you can still control it. Um, it's this beautiful flower and it's part of the pea family, I believe, with those flowers. And it should also be a nitrogen fixer. So it's also improving your soil health. Uh, Pacific Bleeding Heart, such a beautiful one. I always find amphibians like frogs under Pacific Bleeding Heart. It creates like this nice, beautiful mat, and these beautiful pink, like drooping flowers, um, lots of different butterflies I've seen on there, solitary bees. Um, it's definitely one that goes fast at our annual plant sale. And then just wanted to highlight uh, golden rog and Douglas Aster. So this is such a beautiful palette for bees. And it's just like flashing neon lights at bees. Like, come, come to me. Um, and there's been a lot of research that these two growing together are really just that beacon for bees, like attracting them. Um, even planting flowers in clumps of three is a better way to attract different pollinators. So if that's a tactic you'd like to use, I would suggest use that. Cara, do you have a question? I just wanted to say that I grew Douglas Aster the last two years and it's come back in my garden and this year from the sale I bought goldenrod and I planted it next to it. So I'm excited to hear this because that's what I kind of thought it would do. Um, mm -hmm. 
and also I'm not a husky, but I know other people are. So there you go. Um, but yeah, it'll it'll make my husky friends really happy because you get that purple and gold. But I I did plant them together, and I am hopeful that we'll just have just a bee haven right there in the center of our garden. And a reminder: if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A. Yeah, absolutely. I I love that, Kari, and I would love to come to your house and see the goldenrod and the aster together. Um, what's great about goldenrod though, is that it blooms, it can bloom late into the season. So it'll bloom in the summer and then it will keep that and maybe even rebloom in the fall. And so it's a really important resource for bees. Yeah. And it drops its seeds. So it sort of restarts itself. It's very easy to keep growing. Yeah. Yeah. Same with aster. And that's what I love about the two of them. Mm -hmm. All right, so when thinking about native plants, maybe consider what time of year they bloom. Being able to spread those resources out in that bloom time is really going to have a benefit for all of the wildlife that you're attracting to your property. And it's not going to take long. Once you plant it, they will come and they will enjoy. And I hope you get to enjoy them too and be able to spend time outside to see them. Now I do have a question. Thank you. Um, so where can we get those two native flowers and can they be grown from seed? They sure can be grown from seed. Um, we, I think after this, we'll send out some resources and we'll provide our native planting or native plant nursery list. Um, I don't know off the top of my head where you can get them right away. But I would say that we typically do sell them at our plant sale, which we just had. And I don't want you all to wait until next year to get it. Um, but I would say off the top of my head, maybe check out Go Natives Nursery. It's an Edmonds and they sell native plants and they sell them for a reasonable price. Most of the plants are reasonably priced. I'm not saying they're expensive, but just from what I can remember. Um, and so you might be able to find them there. Um, or if you don't find them there, the people are really nice and they may be able to give you direction as to where you could find them. And I'll put the link to our plant sale and then also our alternative plant list in the chat. Perfect. Thanks, Kari. But yes, so blooming times, just, you know, I think it's a great strategy to use when providing resources for wildlife is, you know, have something that blooms early and that, you know, you have something blooming in like early summer, late summer, and then into the fall. And like I said earlier, that Canada goldenrod or Western goldenrod, um, there's two different species, but those are excellent fall bloomers. So we're gonna go into layers too. And I think this is not always the best graphic to use, but I like what it says in that different wildlife, particularly birds here, use different sections of the habitat, right? So you have your overstory, the understory canopy, the shrub layer, and that ground layer. And you'll see that different types of birds really enjoy and use different, excuse me, parts of that layer. But I wanted to give a more feasible example, and I apologize for this photo on the left. It's the only before photo I have of my yard, and I don't know what I was thinking, because the stick is right in the way. But I feel like it gives you enough, you know, to know what was happening here. So things were just planted, and we really started with some of these shrubs and ground layers to kind of see how everything was going to do. I tend to over plant to it's it's a weakness of mine because I like worry about things dying and I'm like no I need to have plants here so I overplant and then I end up having to move things when everything survives you know which is great I'm happy about it I'm also like man I didn't think everything was going to survive it's fine um but then just like kind of after those two couple three years right this last picture is very recent, so everything's not in full bloom or else it would look more full, but you kind of get the idea of like the time, the layering, you know, it's going to happen in stages. It's not something that is going to happen in one planting season. You won't, you know, have the trees and the shrubs and the ground cover. It really is a work in progress and seeing what works for a space, what doesn't work for a space what you want to move or what you want more of, right? I have a lot of coastal strawberry. Um, so if anyone needs strawberry, I'm like happy to put out runners somewhere and you can just come and grab them because it's, it's an endless supply. 
Uh, but bees love it. I find a bunch of salamanders under all the coastal strawberry just hiding out because it's shady in there. It's like these little microclimates. Um, but the point being, vegetation layering, more diversity. The more plants you have, the more wildlife you can attract and the more types of resources and options for cover. So we're gonna go into water. Water is fun because it's something that, you know, during summer, I feel like wildlife are always trying to look for, right? It's really dry. Last summer was really incredibly dry. And so I made sure to keep my bird bath all nice and clean. Um, I don't yet have a circulator. I just haven't bought one, but so I'm cleaning it out like almost every day for algae growth and right. So I'm trying to use my rain barrels and, you know, not use water from the spigot, but it's all personal um, opinions and like what you want to do. Um, but being able to provide water all year round is really great and cleaning it regularly for algae. Um, if it's stagnant water, you definitely want to uh, flush it out every once in a while because of mosquitoes, but you can get circulators or you can have something with like a little fountain and bubble that keeps that water moving and prohibits algae growth and then also helps discourage mosquitoes. And for the pollinators, there are different little terracotta dishes you can do, um, having it shallow, providing some rocks so they don't like drown and, you know, or like accidentally killing pollinators because that's terrible and sad. I don't think any of us want to do that. Um, but yeah, so great ulterior alternatives for pollinators and little smaller insects and you know some folks even provide like a little sugar water for butterflies or oranges um, i've seen jam too some folks provide jam i would just say if you want to do things like that i would just encourage you to clean it daily so you're not attracting any unwanted um, animals that you may not want hi again um we got a question um Somebody says their parents live on five acres, uh, three lakes road in Snohomish, and they would like to repair the borders of the property along the busy road. And they would love to plant low growing native wildflowers along the property line. Is mm -hmm. there a reason that we shouldn't plant along the county maintained road? Um, I would say doing something cheaper, like not investing in really expensive vegetation because they're allowed to maintain that area. And if they come through with a brush cutter and, you know, trim really expensive shrubs or bushes, I would say go cheap if you want. If money and resources aren't an issue, do what you want, but know that the county does have a right to maintain that and cut back if they see fit. Um, all alternatively, if you want to do flowers, I would I would seed it and see what happens. Um, Northwest Meadowscapes is where we get our pollinator packet seeds, and they're not too expensive. And you can even like have different varieties if you want, like get single species and mix it together. It would be it would be incredibly beautiful, and you can certainly do um, Douglas Aster and Canada Goldenrod. There you go. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. All right, so going back to this water conservation and kind of bringing it full circle to rain gardens, right? So being, if you're located within city limits of Everett, then you do qualify for a rain garden rebate, which is fantastic because amphibians would love a rain garden on your property. My goodness. Um, but they're great habitat elements and aesthetically they're super fun. It's this really cool, sustainable green stormwater infrastructure that you're able to have on your own property. Like you're a mini conservationist with a great way to like filter stormwater and doing your part to increase water infiltration, right? So we're recharging our aquifers. Um, you can plant it with all native plants if you want. But yeah, and it also helps but I just like removing all those hard surfaces that create stormwater runoff going directly into the train and then ultimately into the Puget Sound. Uh, but just note the little, if you have a septic, you know, please do not plant, do rain gardens or anything uh, right on top of the drain field or near it just so that it functions properly. So we're gonna move into cover. 
All right, I love this, leave the leaves, right? I think that's something that everyone, excuse me, likes to do in the fall. It's kind of tidy up. Um, and I, I would encourage you all to kind of leave it a little messy. Like maybe we shouldn't be so tidy with leaves. And why I say that is when birds are migrating back down south in the fall, they really need those insects and the, where those insects are, are under the leaves. So when we get rid of the leaves, we're really getting rid of that cover that insects need to kind of hide and burrow down. Um, without those, they go to other places, but having lots of leaves and mulch and just like litter around, you'll see lots of birds, especially towhees when they do like their little double scrape. It's so cute. Um, but they're, they're gleaning and foraging for insects in those leaves. So I implore you, if you can, if you can tolerate the leaves, please leave them. They're so beneficial. Uh, bringing back layered vegetation to cover. Um, it really is that nice, dense foliage that they need in order to hide out from predators, you know, take a sleepy nap. I feel like all the times I want to go birding or like look for birds, I do it around lunchtime. And I feel like all the birds are just hiding out right now at that time. And it's just so troubling to me because it's the wrong time, but they're still there. And then rock piles are a great for cover for little amphibians, especially our Pacific horse frog. Logs are great. Um, and then, you know, brush piles and roosting platforms. So some specific shrubs and ground covers for great cover is Nootka Rose. Um, it's pretty versatile. I really like Nootka Rose um, in areas where there's Himalayan blackberry because it is a great root competitor. It has strong roots and so it tries to get in between those blackberries and to help get rid of blackberry, Himalayan blackberry, we typically shade it out. So we'll like chop it down, shade it out, and then Nootka Rose is just one of the greatest competitors to kind of like beat out that blackberry. Um, another one is sword fern. I know sword fern seems like a very Pacific Northwest plant and it is. And I think we need more sword ferns right now. Um, we've had some die off in the past and I think folks are still trying to research why, um, but sword ferns are great for salamanders and frogs, but specifically salamanders because they like to go into the dense middle section where all the little fronds are gonna come out. They kind of burrow down in there and it provides them like great year round um, hibernation, just cover and overwintering. And then some other cover elements that I think folks don't always think about. Um, Toto boats are really fun, but it's like an artificial way to you know, provide a little habitat for wildlife, all frogs. You know, sometimes bees will also go in there as well. And then with the wood pieces, salamanders love to be under wood. And these are, right, the terrestrial salamanders. So not always the aquatic ones, even though they have an aquatic face. Um, so if you live near a detention pond or things like that, you might have salamander larvae in there. And I hope you can also like hear the frogs at night where you are too, because it's started maybe February, mm, maybe late January where all the frogs were just calling each other because they're mating and they're excited and they're just ready for spring like we all are. And then we have one of our garden snakes down here. So the garter snakes are great because they love tall grass and you know leaving grass a little taller is great for wildlife because it provides some cover and protection. I don't know, I know it might not always look the great, but um, a study showed that if you mowed your grass one, one less time, like every two weeks or something and let it get a little bit longer, the area supported a lot more bees. And right now, I think a lot of people have seen that a lot of our bee species are in trouble and that they need more habitat. So being able to maybe just mow your grass a little less, you know, I think that's hard if you're in a homeowner's association and you have you know, regulations due to that, but when you can in the backyard, maybe leave it long for a little bit longer and let those bees get those resources and then, you know, you can cut it down again. 
So places to raise young, this is gonna be in supplemental, supplemental nesting boxes and then also in vegetation. So going back to that dense vegetation again, there are lots of ways we can help. So bees specifically, especially solitary bees or non-solitary bees, a lot of them are nests in the ground. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen this before, but they make the cutest little burrows and you can just like hear their wings flapping and it's great to pay attention to where they're nesting and then you can mark it and just making sure that no one steps on that and um, it kind of reduces risks all, over, all around for us humans and for the bees. And then when bees aren't nesting directly in the ground, um, in like a bare area, they do it aside bunch grasses. Sometimes they'll use old rodent holes and kind of nest down in there and the queen will um, lay eggs and have some helpers as well. And then yes, there's a little side note about not trimming until April uh, after bumblebee queens have left their overwintering spot. So they'll overwinter in these bunch grass holes um, and you know, old rodent holes as well. And then snags, as you saw earlier in that picture um, of that black cat chickadee nest where the snag had broke, snags are terrific places for wildlife. For bees, mason bees will nest in snags. Um, so the bird brown creeper, they, they don't nest in snags, but they typically use snags. So when the bark peels off the tree, the brown creeper will nest in that peeled bark. So if, if a tree is dead and you feel like it's at risk to damage infrastructure, maybe just don't chop it all the way down, but chop it as high as you feel comfortable with. And I, I promise you birds and bees and other wildlife will love to nest and forage all up in that living snag. Well, Sometimes they're living, sometimes they're not living, but they're living because so much wildlife use them. And woodpeckers are, some people have different opinions whether or not they're a keystone species. So kind of like salmon are a keystone species where without them, uh, the food chain maybe could collapse. But in certain ways, um, Woodpeckers are great keystone species because they make cavities in trees, which are really hard for animals to do. But so many other wildlife use those cavities. So all of our small owls, we have the northern sawwood owl, we have the western screech owl, we have some northern pygmy owls around here. They all use cavities that were excavated by woodpeckers. And in snags, mostly, some of these trees are alive, like partially dead, but I just, probably going on too long about it, but I just wanna indicate how important they are for ecosystems and the fact that we don't have enough snags is really becoming a problem in terms of reproduction for some of these species. I wanted to add this here because not only do we have ground nesting bees, we have the mason bees who nest in cavities and create little holes, but we also have some stem nesting bees. Um, and so I think there's a lot of debate sometimes of when we should cut dead heads off flowers. And I don't think it seems to be very obvious that you know doing so is the best time in the spring. So I just wanted to show this little graphic by Heather Holm, um, who did a lot of this research. She researches uh, wasps and bees and created this fun graphic because there has been so much debate about when to cut back, uh, when to kind of leave things dead, and you know when to start tidying up your pollinator garden. So nesting material, I, I, so I don't have great photos that I've taken of bush tits, but bush tits are my favorite bird. And the reason why is because they're tiny and they're cute and they flock together. But most importantly, they have the best nest. After this, please Google bush tit nest. 
and they have this hanging pendulum of a nest with an opening in the front. It's made of moss and spider webs. So you can see this bush tit here. It actually looks like a female. I believe females have the lighter colored eyes and males have dark eyes, unless I'm reversing it. But they do have a sexual dimorphism where you can tell the difference between males and females, which is also kind of fun. Um, Cause you know, like chickadees, you can't really tell who's the male and female. You just hear like the chickadee dee -dee, or the hey, sweetie type. But so I think it's either getting, it's hard to tell if it's like a mixture of like a spider web, which they use a lot for nest building, um, or if it's like an old like cocoon of some sort. But I thought this was like, my partner took this photo and did not cue me on to what he was photographing, but I was real excited when I saw this. I was like, I think he took it like two days ago. I'm like, nope, I'm adding this presentation right now. Like this has got to go in. I think it's just such a fun photo. But leaving nesting material out can really be helpful to birds. Um, I listed some kind of do's and don'ts. Uh, you know, there's always like an asterisk depending on like where you're gathering material, whether or not, um, you know, pesticides are sprayed nearby. Um, so there's always kind of a what if, you know, just making sure things are as natural as possible, things are dried um, and aren't, you know, diseased or like have any obvious mites on them or anything else. Then preventing conflicts. So I, I love cats and I'm happy when cats are free to roam, um, but cats and dogs, all have really instincts to, you know, maybe sometimes like chase down a bird, chase some rodent. I know that in my own backyard, my dogs are fenced in, but I have to admit that they have killed a few rats and at least one mole since we've lived here. And it's unfortunate. I try to really block them off for areas where I really don't want them to be and or where I think other wildlife are and I don't want any conflicts. You know, dogs can be small animal aggressive at times and we just always need to, you know, if we're, if we're building it and having the wildlife come, we also need to protect them and make sure that our pets or anything else aren't going to be uh, causing them harm or discouraging them from entering the area that we all work so hard to provide for them. Um, another thing is windows. Windows can be, really tricky for birds, you know, the reflecting trees or the sky or anything else. And, you know, they can have collisions with windows and there's different aesthetically pleasing ways as to how to minimize that. You know, maybe it's not the string hanging in front of your window. Maybe it's some decals or something like that or a UV coating over your window, which can help uh, with the reflection that, you know, windows typically have, there are options, but I just wanted to kind of put that little nugget out there for folks to kind of chew on and debate what's going to work best for them. Um, moving feeders, I used to have a bird feeder that was like attached to the window, and I noticed that had caused some conflicts with, you know, birds hitting the window every now and then. Um, on really sunny days, I just kind of drop my blinds, but keep them open. And that has seemed to definitely help a lot in terms of like less uh, birds crashing into this one window I have that's like directly in front of a tree. And it, yeah, it was not great for anyone. Um, and I just wanna add that if you do have an ill animal or bird on your property and you can handle it safely without causing risk to you or anyone else, um, you know, put it in a box and there's uh, lots of wildlife rehabilitators, especially when birds crash into the window, they may seem okay, um, but afterwards they can still die from, you know, their brain getting injured um, and things like that. So there are different medicines that wild ha wildlife rehabilitators have to help decrease their chance of passing. I just wanted to share, Sarah, that um, Nancy put in there that safewings.ca um, has a lot of suggestions um, about bird-friendly windows. So I'll put that into the chat. Oh, great. Thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like it is uh, my duty just to 
let you all know uh, there is an issue with bird feeders. I, I fed birds for a while, my partner and I, and we really enjoyed all the birds we saw at the feeders. And then it was like 2020, COVID, and then we got this notice about, you know, the salmonella going around and the problem was dirty feeders. And so this analogy that was used um, probably a year ago, but I think it's Monica van der Verven who used this analogy. So I'm gonna credit her, but also copy it. Um, it's like having a sick college student in a dorm and he invites all of his friends over for pizza. That's kind of like what a bird feeder is sometimes. Like everyone's sh sharing germs. And I think this is more, like it, we're all able to grasp that more with COVID and having to wear face masks. And in the beginning, like, you know, when COVID first hit, we were like, should we just wear gloves and no face masks? And like, you know, none of us knew anything. And I think it's just a responsibility that if you choose to feed birds, just please clean them at least every two weeks. Um, I have a typo, I see every two week. I, yeah. Sorry about that, I'll change that. But yeah, so clean them regularly. And then I included a hyperlink down here. So you know how to properly clean a feeder, letting it dry fully um, before you put it back out again. And then making sure you're just kind of like changing that food out. So if you are cleaning it very regularly, maybe don't fill it to the top so you're not wasting bird seed because you do wanna kind of make sure all that bird food is gone so you're not putting it back into the feeder. So there's a question about hummingbird feeders uh, from Carol. Uh, hummingbird feeders are typically changed every few days. Is that also a problem? I, you know, I think changing them every few days is best, especially during the summer where, you know, they're more prone to get like super hot. Um, this hyperlink down here, I, I know folks can't click on it right now, but it's from All About Birds. Dot com, which is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, they have some recommendations in there and I apologize, I can't remember right off the top of my head, but their recommendation I believe was changing it every three days, the sugar water, and they prefer that you don't use dye. Dye is not needed to attract the hummingbirds, it's just more aesthetic. Um, but yeah, just table, white sugar and water, I think it's a, a one to three or one to four ratio. Um, but there is more information there. So all about birds, how to keep clean feeders. Good resource. I think in the chat. So thanks for the website, Sarah. Great. Thanks, Kari. And I know I went through this super fast, but I do have some resources for you all. Um, if you're trying to figure out what native plant is going to work on your property, there are lots of resources. So King County Native Plant Guide, you can put in your environmental factors. So those environmental factors are sunlight, soil moisture. Um, and so being able to know those of where you're planting, like this area receives full sun, the soil's moderately dry to fairly moist, and it will basically like pop up all the plants that should be good for that location. And you can kind of go through, see some of their wildlife benefits, see the color of the flowers. And I believe they also have a bloom time. I'm not entirely sure. I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but great plant picks also. I know they do blooming times. So great plant picks. Uh, that's unfortunately not on here. Um, they're another great resource for getting native plant suggestions as well. And then some of the pollinator resources, Xerxes Society is always great. I really like the Burke Museum because sometimes I'll see um, different wildlife like mammals and I won't entirely be sure what it is. I'd never know the difference between like a long-tailed or a short-tailed weasel. And they really go through like all of the mammals uh, here in Washington. Um, yeah, other wildlife as well. And so that Bee and Pollinator book by Heather Holm. And then we have a rain garden handbook for Western Washington. If a rain garden is something you're interested in, you can kind of see more about what it entails to install a rain garden, any maintenance ideas. And then that also has some plant suggestions too. 
And then other great resources. So Washington Department of Fish and Wild, Wild, Wildlife has some great living with wildlife resources. They also have, um, you know, living with maybe not the best wildlife, but like if you're having an issue with raccoons or anything that can be considered a quote unquote pest, they also give you some advice as to, you know, how to exclude uh, certain animals from getting into a place that you do not want them to be. And then we have lots of time for questions. So if anyone has any specific questions um, tailored to your property, or if you all wanna discuss different plant options, I'm happy to stick around and go through some suggestions with you all. Thank you so much, Sarah. I, I love this presentation and I love all the ideas and I'm always happy when I've done some of them, but there's always more to try. <laughs> so um, yeah. thank you so much for that. There was a question on Facebook of if there was a way to get the PowerPoint, and I said that we'll be posting it on the website next week, so we'll make sure and get that out to folks, because I know Great. there's so much detail, but if there are other questions, please feel free to put those in the chat or the Q&A or on Facebook. Yeah, and I just want to add, um, except for the California poppy and one of these larger sunflowers in here, this this mix of flowers is that pollinator mix from Northwest Meadowscape. So we have some globe gillas, uh, some clarkias and things like that. And it's, it's a great mix. I, I have never seen a California quail on my property in my backyard. And of course, like when I put out the mix, I did a little raking. And so there's a bunch of flower seeds and the quail was in the pollinator garden, like eating all the seeds. And I, like didn't have the heart to shoo it away. So I was like, ah, that's what it's all here for. But I also want flowers. So it was like this internal struggle. It's like, it's fine. I overseeded like usual. There's some spare seeds in there for the quail. <laughs> I have seen quail, but it's been a long time. It was back in View Ridge, probably 20, 30 years ago, maybe even. Goodness. Yeah. Um, someone, when we were talking about the side of the road, had added that they planted snowberry and Indian plum on the border of the long road. Um, those sound like great plants to me. Do you have other suggestions that might provide berries too, Sarah? Service berry is one of my favorites, and it's also what I feel is like the tastiest edible berry, aside from huckleberries. Um, they're really tasty. I, I see a lot of birds on the service barrier I have in my backyard. The flowers are white. They attract great pollinators. And yeah, I really like service berry, red flowering currants, even dogwood have berries that birds like. They're not edible to humans because they're not tasty. Um, neither is snowberry though. Snowberry is not edible for humans, uh, but birds still like them. So I would suggest service berry. And then if you can um, do some beaked hazelnut or beaked filbert, it's the same plant, just different common names. And that's also a great one to have edible nuts and you know, Pacific crab apple, it's a tree. It likes wetter areas. So, you know, I have one growing my yard that is not entirely wet. So I'm trying to test how dry it can go. Um, but that also might be a good option. But I know Big tails on that will still go do good in like an area that snowberry um, and other plants are. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, not seeing any other questions right now, but I've got an expert on birds and plants here. Um, maybe if we also could just sort of talk a little bit about our plant sale and the timing and such, because I know a lot of people go to conservation districts for native plant sales, and there's plenty of other places to buy them too, but. Um, maybe Sarah, if you want to just talk about how people get connected with our plant sale. Yeah, I think one of the best things to do is to sign up for our plant sale newsletter. So if you go to snohomishcd.org, click on events, and then you'll see our annual plant sale page. Click on that. And then in the top right corner, you can sign up for the newsletter. We're not going to spam you all the time, but we are going to tell you you know, when you can expect pre-orders to be open, um, the types of species we're selling that year, um, 
occasionally like some tips, but it's a really great resource because we're, we're not trying to make money off the plant sale, um, but we are trying to get native plants out. So I feel like we, in terms of monetary value, like we price things really, really well. In some instances, like you can get five bare root service berry for like $10. And, you know, that's where I've been able to really acquire a lot of the native plants I have in my yard and, you know, seen in the pictures here is, you know, I don't have a lot of resources to spend a lot of money on plants. And so being able to get them from the plant sale and figure out what you like and what's going to work in your yard and it's not breaking your bank um, and just being able to have some good options of, you know, try this here. How does it do? Um, and I, yeah, I just appreciate how like equitable it is because we're not trying to make money off these plants. We just want people to have native plants. Mm, exactly. Um, there's a question from Carol. Um, ornamental grasses like, and I'm gonna miscanthus, not sure if it's spelled right. Um, are they good for birds? That is, so my knowledge sometimes stops at ornamentals, but I, I don't see the harm. I'm just not entirely sure. I know they're still going to provide that cover habitat, right, for other species. Um, they very could well be great seeds for birds. Uh, I, I just don't know. And I apologize. I was going to say that usually when you have because certain, like I think of sunflowers, right? They provide, and I want to say a nectar early and then the seed later. So when you can get a plant that has two ways to feed a bird, that's like double win, right? Absolutely, yeah. And something I should have added, um, I'm still really working through with like how I want to present some of this information. And sometimes I feel like I can present too much where it's just like very, overwhelming for folks, um, but flower shape and color, having a diversity of that is also gonna be really beneficial. Like if you're, if you're really into pollinators, into butterflies and bees, having flowers that are different shapes and colors, um, you know, pollinators see in like ultraviolet, I think. And so they see things way differently than we do. And so having that beacon of color in different shape is going to attract different things. Um, you know, a, you might not find a hummingbird eating out of a foxglove, but you definitely will see little bees with their butts hanging out in a foxglove, which I think is like the cutest thing, even though foxgloves aren't native here. Uh, that was just kind of that shape of flower that like rang into my head right away. Just walk up to me Sorry about like... that. Um, I was just going to find the um, King County Wastewater Treatment Division um, series. We did a whole, I think there was eight in total, uh, 2022 Sustainable Yard Care series. And so I'm going to paste that link in the chat too. Um, Sarah participated in that. I participated in that. Um, David from our staff. Joe as well on growing food. So from stormwater to habitat, living with habitat. So this is like the base of how you can create this in your yard. But what if you have habitat you don't you don't necessarily want to live with? How do you work through that? So there's the whole series has a whole bunch of different tips um, for living with and um, creating uh, habitat for animals and such. So I would recommend checking out that too. Yeah, what's great about that is that it, it got broken down more so than this presentation is. Like I tried to fit in like native plant suggestions and with, you know, creating habitat for wildlife, but those two are really parsed out. Uh, I think there's one that's like jumpstart your yard. So if you're just a beginner and like really finding different ideas, how to create a, you know, a friendly landscape in your yard, that's a great one. They have one specifically of just about native plants. And then Monica and I do one with landscaping for wildlife. Um, there's, in, there's one for, uh, water too. So like conserving water, uh, pests. So if you have urban agriculture and you have a raised bed where you're growing fruits and veggies, our colleague, Joe Crumbly, uh, talks about 
pests, garden pests as well. So it's a really wide ranging series that we did. And it's always really fun to collaborate with Bright Rotter um, when we have the opportunity. Absolutely. And then I'm going to put in the chat here too. Um, for next week, if you have kids or if you have grandkids or know people with kids, um, we are going to do the uh, family gardening class. And so that will be a nice opportunity to kind of hear different ways that youth can be involved in the garden and um, take part. Um, they'll be making their own little terrariums. And so that's coming up on April 7th. That'll be super fun. Um, I think it may be over spring break for some students. So if you're looking for something to do <laughs> Thursday night, if, if the rains return, which they just might, um, this could be fun for them that way. Um, there's just a lot of resources between us and the city and then also our partners in this, also our uh, WSU, Snohomish County Extension, Master Gardeners and such, uh, they also have a lot of resources. So if you're stuck on, pest management, or how can I, uh, they can help a lot with that too. So, yeah, but I'm not seeing any more questions, Sarah. So I'm going to put out a last call to our audience members. If you have anything you, you're burning, you need to ask, you just have to get that question asked. This would be the time. Yeah, and just to add about next week's family gardening presentation, our colleague Michaela will be hosting that. And Michaela's newer to the district. She's been here for maybe about six months. So she brings like this fresh set of eyes and really new innovative ideas to get kids involved uh, with the environment and conservation. And she has a lot of great tools and tactic that she uses to get kids involved. And I love the energy that she brings when working with kids and is such a delight. Um, I think that's going to be a really great pod. Uh, I said podcast almost, but a great webinar uh, for kids to get involved. And, you know, I kind of make my son attend. So we'll see how that goes. There you go. <laughs> um, we have another question, actually, uh, Sarah. So Carol asks, is it too late to plant the pollinator mix that we um, have shown here? No, I don't think it's too late. It says fall or spring, and we're still like in the early stages of spring with having some rain. So I think you're definitely fine to get that pollinator mix, rake it into some bare soil, um, then get some water. And you should have success this summer with, you know, I, I think I, I did this mix in the photo here, probably like early spring, and this is what it looked like in July. So it's not too late. She says, yay, thank you. <laughs> I would agree. Uh, I think that sometimes we can plant not any time, but almost any time in Pacific Northwest weather and climate conditions, you just got to pay attention. But it's very, it's, the ground is very forgiving, <laughs> I would say here. Um, but yeah. when you can let earth or well, you know, let the rain give things a good start, that's really helpful. That's why we always suggest you know, spring or fall, as opposed to you don't want to plant in July, unless you have, you're going to be watering that plant a lot. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that's a large part of um, our culture here in the U.S. is that being able to enjoy that outside time in the summer when we do have, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, when we have like those three months of sun. We're like, ah, oh, like, let us get our vitamin D back. Come spend time outside. Um, but what we typically suggest folks to do is that planting season kind of starts, you know, like the end of October, but definitely November through April. So planting outside of that time frame, you're really going to need um, some supplemental watering. So if you're going on vacation, um, maybe set up a timer or something like that. But the best time, especially with water conservation, not having to plant in the spring and summer doing it in the fall and winter you're going to save water but also the roots are dormant by then so if you're planting like shrubs and trees i would implore you to do that in the fall and the winter not when it's frozen but like you know enough to like dig around in the soil um, and you're gonna have a lot more success that that plant is going to have time to establish its roots like as the soil gets warmer um, and then 
not needing a lot of water in the summer. You'll still have to water, you know, that first year or two uh, just for the summertime. But other than that, it will be just free to grow. And you won't really have to pay that much attention to watering, especially if it's a native plant and planted in the right place. There's all those rules. <laughs> so many rules. Well, and that's why it's nice to try with small, give it a year or so that, what is it? Creep, no, sleep, creep, and then something else takes off. I don't know that one. Oh, well, all I can really say is that when you buy plants from a plant sale, they look like sticks, many of them. They're very odd. Um, it doesn't, it's not like flowering plant right then, but if you give it a year or two, by that third year, it usually starts to take off and then you'll be, oh, I got to prune this thing because it will just keep growing. Yeah. I want to just add that these, let me see if it's going to click on it. So this current here, they're not huge, but they're only like two years old, really. Um, okay. Technically three, but like they were so small when they started and like, it didn't take a lot of time and these were bare roots. So they're, the stock is smaller, they're easier to plant. So you plant things a lot faster. Um, so just wanted to plug that too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've probably, and I like that I've had evergreen huckleberries from multiple years and they're all different heights. So it's kind of fun to just like, oh, that's the, that vintage or whatever, but they all do start to grow and become just elements of your garden that you couldn't possibly live without, like my Western Trillium. Ooh. Yeah, and I, I love just doing it on your own. Like it's, it's great to get guidance from folks, but when you do it hands-on, you gain a lot more of the experience and you get those nuances of you know, your, your yard and what's going to work best in certain places, a, a spot that's been troubling for you to get things established and being able to like work through that and find, you know, something that's really going to be beneficial for that space. Totally agree. Totally agree. And I am laughing at your, your stick right through the center. I know. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> a bad choice there, but still provides a great example. It does. Example um, of how not to take a picture. <laughs> One last link I put in the chat here for people in the Zoom is the art contest. And two things I would point out there. One, looking at the art will brighten your day. Anytime you look at the, the art that came in from Snohomish County and Kamano, it's fantastic. Um, and then secondarily, if you do want to learn how to draw birds, that was something that Michaela did. Um, it was back in February, we did that webinar. And even I can draw a bird with the, <laughs> the materials she provided and the guidance. And so if you're just looking for another little kid-friendly activity, just on that page, you'll be able to get to the resources and find the recording of the webinar. So we do like to educate from kid level up to you know adult. Um, we all can use some creativity and some native plants and birds and animals in our lives. So. Okay. Any parting uh, thoughts, Sarah? No, thank you all for joining. This has been a blast and always like when Kari and I like are in a presentation together because we have such great banter, I think, and hopefully you all do too. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, know I, I absolutely love it. We've we've had some fun times over the years, and you'll hopefully see us back out in the world um, as we move into summer. Fair season should be back again, so we'll be at booths um, and available for questions out and about. But yeah, getting thank you so much from Marilyn. Thank you very much. Yeah, Sarah, great job. I always learn something. Um, and uh, I will be sending out this recording after the fact and the slides. They'll be on the website. I'll probably get it out to you on Monday. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out through the um, Eventbrite and we'll go from there. Oh, thanks for the great presentation. I'm from Ottawa, Canada. <laughs> Very informative. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Evening. And another thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, everyone. Yes, and happy native plant planting. Yes. Yay. Indeed, Indian plum, I think that was you, uh, one of the best plants out there. I wish I had more room for it because I think it's so delightful. I love Indian plum. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all so much. All right. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful evening. Bye.